Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. We talk a lot about horror on this channel, but the real horror out there is how easy it is for your data to fall in the hands of disreputable people. That's why today's video is sponsored by Aura. While you're enjoying today's spooky video, data brokers, those things that go bump on the web, could already be selling your information to scanners, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, your health records, your relatives, they could all be out there. That's why I've been using Aura. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests just for me. It was simple to use and very intuitive, and I had barely gotten out of the setup process, and it was already blocking over 20 data broker requests on my behalf. Aura protects your passwords, your banking information, everything you need for day-to-day -day online life. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use my information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, other sensitive information, things like a certain YouTube channel that you all enjoy listening to so much. Aura also does much more to protect me and my family from online threats, the kind you can't see. It comes with other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It really is just that easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. I hear you saying, but Dr. Plague, I have one or two of these tools already. But, dear readers, not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Readers of my fine tales can tell you why that never ends well. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping me safe so I can focus on other tasks like finishing my latest book or uploading my most recent video. I value my privacy, and I know you value yours. You can go to Aura.com, that's A-U-R-A dot com, to start your two-week free trial. You can also check out the link below and start your free trial with Aura. So why not give Aura a try and protect yourself from the real monsters out there? It started as a weekend trip to Las Vegas. A three-day weekend was coming up, so my friends wanted to add spice to their lives, and Vegas was on the bucket list. Not mine, theirs. I wanted to stay home and watch old cartoons I'd bought from the video store. Maybe just sleep in that Friday. Maybe I didn't make it clear to them, or maybe they just ignored me, but they had already bought me a plane ticket and booked a hotel room. With it being too late to refund anything, and out of financial obligation, I couldn't let that money go to waste and be a bad, boring friend. We landed and reached the hotel before noon. I had five friends with me, and everyone was feeling the excitement, especially one, Sadie. Sadie was the group extrovert, the leader, she didn't suggest Vegas, but she sure as hell put herself in charge the moment the others considered the trip. Standing in front of us in the hotel lobby, she held a list of places for us to check out. I stood by and let her list them off, everyone casting votes on which place to skip, which place to start with, and which ones to save for last. What we ended up with was a schedule starting with the most fun and the physically demanding stuff, gradually leading towards the more exciting, unsavory stuff. I had already mentally decided to call it when evening rolled around, to avoid the clubs. I guess I am the boring friend after all. I will say this about Vegas. A lot of places were surprisingly clean. Don't get me wrong, we saw plenty of streets that looked like the physical manifestation of a painful hangover, but many were straight out of Hollywood. It's colorful, it's loud, it's a theme park that people live in. It was almost surreal when you ended up on streets that looked plain or ordinary. Men in suits, kids leaving school, you know, that kind of thing. I guess I knew very little about Las Vegas, of course. A lot of it is normal, but still, I found it interesting. 
When you turned onto a street where the buildings looked like modern art, I knew I'd be in for a hell of a time. Day drinking, slot machines, live shows, you name it. I can admire the work and effort they put into all of it, but it just wasn't for me. When we had dinner at what I thought was a nice casino restaurant, until I saw the male servers were in very tight, revealing outfits, I had just about mentally checked out. Hey, I think I'm done, I said, before the chorus of awes could get any louder. I'm tired. The, the flight gave me a headache and everything. Take a pill in my purse, one of them said. I, I think rest is better right now. You guys have fun, though. Try not to stay out too late. I felt older with every word and excuse. I'm 28, and I was talking like I was 48. That being said, the amount of free relief I felt walking into that empty hotel room was criminal, and I must have felt tired to some degree because the bed I fell onto had my eyes drooping. It was the cool, soft Egyptian cotton sheets that had me feeling that sleep was the finest pleasure on earth. I know that says a lot about me, but still, it was pretty good. I turned on the TV and flicked through the channels, finally ending up on a new episode of How It's Made. Well, maybe it was an old episode, I don't know. What I can say for sure is that my brain was locked in, and as the sun fell behind the horizon, I was gone. I woke up to a call. My phone was buzzing beside my head, the vibration doing more to wake me up than the lighthearted jingle I had set for a ringtone. I said the name, Sadie. Yeah, I groaned, what's up? It's five in the morning, where are you guys? Hey, you're really missing out. Sadie's voice was garbled by music. We're up the road towards the red place. We're in the club with the big green monster truck out front. You can't miss it, come on. You underestimate me, I muttered. I turned over in bed and looked out the window. The city was alive, even after a full night. Lights and sounds, the distant thump of music. There had to be some stellar muting in the walls because I could see that the party was not far away. I thought about going. It was the idea of missing out that bothered me a little because I didn't think I was missing out. Yet when so many people you call friends say that you are, you start to wonder if you really know how to live at all. Maybe the happiness you feel from simple things isn't as potent as the happiness you get while being drunk in a club with your friends. Screw that, I said. I knew that was a dumb way of thinking, but I also didn't feel that tired anymore. The least I could do was enjoy the trip my own way, and at that moment, I just wanted to go for a walk. Not in the streets, of course, but I did remember Sadie mentioning on her list of activities a walk thing just outside of town. I was the only one who was interested, and she didn't seem too enthusiastic when she had told us about it. I got out of bed and texted her, asking for the address, to which she sent me the Google business thing. No official page or anything, just a bare-bones minimum. It lacked that Vegas flair everything had, and for me, that was a plus. Just after midday, I arrived at the place. I paid the taxi guy and jumped out into the heat. I always had decent clothes for outdoors with me. It was like my entire wardrobe. Yet the heat was still a surprise. I guess being in a cool car for half an hour would make it feel like stepping into an oven. The trail started a small collection of shacks, with one large building that looked like it was in good condition. It was painted an ugly yellow with small cartoonish paints all around it, like a cactus character or a tumbleweed with some classic roadrunner and wily e. coyote thrown in for good measure. I don't think they were going for a cowboy theme, but that's what I felt when I saw the owner, a tall woman wearing chaps, a 10-gallon hat and a checkered shirt. She looked like she had seen some things, just shocking the way the skin beneath her eyes seemed to bubble. Yet, when she saw me, she gave me the warmest smile. 
You must be Cassandra, right? She greeted, marching over with her hands outstretched. Um, yes, that's me, I said, holding mine out. She took and shook my arm like a wet noodle. I'm not too late? Not at all. Some eccentric fellows are already set up for the first group today. There's still time to join them before they go. Group? Yeah, I find it better to send people in groups. Less chance of people getting lost or bunching up on the trail. Better for pictures, you see. Right. We also have a route for horses, if you're interested in... No, 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 no. No horses. They, uh... They scare me. I'll, I'll stick with the walking group. Fair enough. I won't press you. I always hated when people said that. Nothing made me feel more pressured... Still, she was the sweetest lady, sweeter than honey and iced tea. I didn't say anything more and followed her to the start of the trail. There was clear signage with numbers near the fence and gate, indicating the different trails. The trail she pointed me to didn't have a sign or a number. The first group should be waiting there. She pointed down the trail towards a huge rock. They all set to leave in five minutes. Do you have anything you need? Water, hat, sunscreen, I said. Good. It's hot now, but it'll get cool later. Little known fact about the desert, she said, pointing up a finger as if she expected me to take notes. I knew that already, of course. I nodded and started walking up the trail towards the rock. She already started her march back to the main building. I was feeling pretty good, excited even. I love the oppressiveness of the desert, and I was hoping that being 20 minutes out of Vegas, I would get to enjoy the natural beauty of it all. There was a group of people waiting by the rock, but looking at them was a little weird. I mean, I don't want to show my ignorance, but I think they were religious or just had some kind of cultural thing going on. Maybe I was about to walk with some foreigners from overseas, or it was some kind of LARP group. I didn't know. There was at least 20 people there, and it was hard to tell if they were all men or not, because they were dressed in robes from head to toe. Not flowing robes either, but a lot more neat and constructed. My first real thought wasn't, what the hell are they wearing, but how the hell haven't they melted? All but one of their robes was red, but the last one, which was black... He stood tall and straight, the first one to turn in my direction. Upon seeing them, I was already psyching myself up to say something. Approaching the group of people alone was terrifying. As you can guess, Sadie and her group are the only ones who adopted me at work. I was just happy they did, because I would have never gone up to them otherwise. Room for, room for one more? I said with a forced smile. I was quiet at first, but I supposed it was better to be a little too quiet than a little too loud. The ones in the red robes turned from me and looked at the one in black. Please do. Have you ever been on this trail before? The man said. No, first time. Be sure to stick close and conserve your energy. It is to be a long walk. The man in the black robe pointed towards the desert the distant rocks and the sparse foliage. It felt so surreal, but also right, like I had stepped into the adventure I wanted. Only something kept throwing me off. It was the silence from such a large group. When we started on the path, I didn't hear anything from the people in the red robes. The only ones I had heard speak up until that moment was the man in the black robe. He would speak to me every few minutes, usually to point something out, but the gaps between those moments were growing longer. Initially, I thought he was a guide, but it became clear as he drifted into the others that he was just familiar with the trail. I was too shy to keep the conversation going, finding myself just enjoying the sights. The range of colors was just incredible, so many people think the desert is just muted dry color, but there are just so many different shades of light and dark. The vibrant oranges when we found ourselves in the ravine were stunning. 
We followed a stream in that shallow ravine until the trail opened into the desert again, just in time to see the sun settle beyond the horizon. The sky becomes like blood, the man in the black robe said behind me. I jumped, not at his voice, but because I thought I was at the back of the group. I wanted to keep everyone in view. A beautiful red, yes? I turned to look at him. He was looking at me. I could see his eyes, his pale skin through the slit in the robe. It was odd to look at because his hands were dark. Another culture thing, maybe. When I had finally registered his words as a question, I stuttered in response. Oh, yeah, I said, feeling a chill run down my spine. I took the hoodie out of my backpack and pulled it on. Amazing how fast the cold comes in too, huh? Yes. Do you think you can make the walk back? He asked. We should almost be there, so... No, no, we are quite far now, he corrected. By night, the journey back should be quicker, but five hours seems about right. My heart sank. I thought we had taken some turns and were just about to see the start of the trail again over the hill. Yet, looking around, I should have been able to see that distant glow of Vegas. Instead, all I saw was dark, robed figures shambling ever onward into the desert. My water had run out, my phone had long since died, and I was hungry. My panic was stiff at first, but... I began to hear it in my voice. Then, well, let's turn back, I said. You can go back. We're heading somewhere else, the man in black said. Is it close? Very, but you won't be able to join us, not as you are. He looked me up and down, and I wondered if he was referring to my clothes and how I stood out amongst them, but something in his eyes showed a different kind of disgust. It was like my entire existence didn't fit in, not just my clothes. His tone was growing more serious, less friendly. He was losing patience. At that point, I noticed a building noise, a rumbling which I mistook for chatter amongst the men and women in red robes, but as it grew louder, it sounded more like an uncoordinated hum like they were all humming a song that none of them knew the lyrics to. Again, too late, he murmured, as it should be, so it is. Too late, I repeated. Mind where you step. Once your weight is on your foot, your choice is made. The humming had reached a breaking point in tone. The night sky became a lot darker. The stars, the moon, they vanished. The midnight blue became pitch black, a surreal void. It felt like something was blocking it out of sight, because that same darkness seemed to move wherever I looked. Yet the desert remained illuminated by some strange source of light. I could see the red robes against the pitch black, and I watched as they marched across the sand. I was overwhelmed by a sense of dread, a feeling of weakness. My whole body began to ache, and every effort seemed to strain my muscles and even my bones. I knew this feeling, the one bubbling inside me. It was many years ago when I was a child. I was coughing in bed constantly, day after day. That weakness kept me wondering how hollow I could get. I felt as weak and flimsy as a thin plastic bag. My heart, I could feel its every beat, as if all my insides were numb, and only it soldiered on. I was waiting for it to give out. The people in the red robes began to shed their blood-red fabric, naked forms that began to age and decay before my eyes. A space in the inky void ahead of me opened up, a shining white door, tall and thin. The way was clear, and I didn't have it in me to walk on. I was terrified. Why are you scared? The man in the black robe asked. What awaits you is an end to the pain. Keep walking strong. He placed his hand on my shoulder and guided me. The people ahead of me were 
growing more grotesque by the second. I had no idea what made their bodies, so I was made to watch them unmake themselves. The skin, the fat, the pus, the blood, the shades of red began to turn blue and green. My head was burning inside. I felt dehydrated. While my body was in a state of shock and fear, my mind was trying its best to grip reality, to steer me away. The man in the black robe seemed to sense it because he stopped walking and looked at me. With all my energy, I looked at him. You cannot go back now. Your life is with them. It is only natural to pass over to the next plane. I felt the heat of my tears. It was just like those nights years ago. The, the very real fear of death. I'm ashamed of it now, but I wasn't thinking of my loved ones, not even my family. I didn't think of all the wrongs I'd done, the regrets I had. When I looked into that man's eyes, all I thought was, why now? The man seemed to sigh, but I didn't hear the exhale. His shoulders slumped and the humming faded completely. The shambling corpses turned around to look back at me with their empty eye sockets. The dead must be laid to rest. It is only natural. The earth will bind the body and free the spirit. The man in black grabbed both my shoulders, twisting me around, and began to lay me on the ground as if I weighed nothing. I couldn't move. I could only watch as he began to scoop sand with his hands over me. I heard the rumbling again, but it sounded angry. I looked up as far as I could. It made my neck ache. I could see the world upside down, the white arch and the silhouettes of the dead against the divine light. The corpses were moving closer, and they radiated malice. More tears and even a pathetic whimper. Hush, the man in the black robe said. They are not upon you yet. He was working fast, and only a few seconds later, I could feel sand over every inch of my body. He finished by pouring the sand over my face, covering me completely. I heard the dead close in. I heard a muttering of words, then I heard his scream. I try not to imagine the pain one must feel to make those sounds. He was still alive, but his cries grew further away as they carried him towards the white arch. I could gather that much from what I heard. As his voice faded, the rumbling ceased and strength returned to my body. I could breathe, and I was breathing in sand. I was choking, gasping. I sat up, coughing and sputtering. I noticed immediately the pink and purple hue of the sky. On my back, I felt the warmth of the morning sun. Looking all around, I saw nothing. No dead people, no man in black, no inky sky, no white arch. All the evidence I had was the blood on the sand, and it's trailing off before stopping completely. I found a road and somebody to point me in the direction of Vegas, but they weren't willing to give me a lift back. Luckily, after an hour or two of walking, someone else did. I watched as we drove past the road leading to the yellow building where the trail began. I think I even saw Dorothy talking to a group of tourists. When I arrived at the hotel, I dug my room key out of my sandy backpack and held it to the front of the machine. It still worked, and a few seconds later I was taking a shower, trying to let the hot water bring a little more warmth to my body. After a while, I thought about the man in black. He wasn't a dead man, not like the others. He didn't seem evil, but he didn't seem sane either. No matter what the conclusion I made about him, I realized that he saved my life, and he paid the price for it. It was a thought that snapped everything into place, and I cried in the shower as all the feelings rushed at me once again. I spoke about this experience to only one person. A priest. I don't think he believed a word I said. Not really. I think he thought I was talking about a dream or a nightmare. Yet he showed enough concern to say something wise and biblical about sacrifice. 
It wasn't his words that convinced me to redefine my faith. It was the thought of believing in nothing when something like that happened to me. It didn't sit right. That's what I gained for the price that someone else paid. I pray that it's enough. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead and Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Sarah SMR42, Grim Reaper, and Tomboy Top Uwu for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a special thanks to Grim Reaper, who appears to have subscribed not just on YouTube, but also on my Patreon. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you, and your support is always appreciated. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon, or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early, at 8.30 a.m., as opposed to 8.30 p.m., my time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book, anytime I write one, on your doorstep in, hopefully, a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.